Good morning. So in the interest of time, I think we'll all get started. Um, welcome to our joint webinar with Lifebox and N95 Decon on N95 decontamination reuse. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to host this session today. Uh, my name is Nicole Starr. I'm a general surgery resident at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm the senior fellow at the Lifebox Foundation. So before we begin, just to share some logistics about this session, we will have live interpretation available in Spanish and French. So if you'd like to use this, please click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and you can select the language you want to use this function. If you click mute your original audio, you'll hear the interpreted language more clearly. And I uh, just wanted to make you aware that both slides and this recording will be made available after the presentation. Uh, please ask any questions you have throughout the presentation by using the chat box. You can also find this on the bottom uh, bar at your screen. We'll be answering your questions either in the chat or during the verbal question and answer sessions throughout the webinar. Please try not to use the chat box for discussion or to answer questions for other participants so that participants can see our answers. Let's begin. N95 DECON is a consortium of over 100 scientists from many global institutions, including clinicians, engineers, and researchers. And since March of this year, we've been evaluating the literature regarding N95 decontamination methods and other issues related to mask wear during the COVID-19 pandemic. We publish technical reports and fact sheets, which are available on our website. We're an independent group with no financial interest and we are volunteer based. All of our published information undergoes a rigorous scientific review process. And to answer your questions today, we're incredibly lucky to have our speaker panel and three additional experts on this topic, Manu, David, and Tom. Dr. Manu Prakash is a professor of bioengineering at Stanford University. Dr. David Rempel is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And Dr. Tom Bayer is the director of the Stanford Phototonics Research Center. Today, you'll learn about recommended PPE for the care of COVID-19 patients and the mechanism of function of N95 respirators. You'll also learn about what evidence we've gathered to support the use of hydrogen peroxide vapor, germicidal ultraviolet light, and dry or humid heat to decontaminate N95 respirators. You'll learn about the importance of both fit and filtration to the effectiveness of the respirator, as well as considering bioburden reduction and the hazards of each method when considering how to decontaminate N95 masks. So now I'll pass it along to Ashley for us to get started. Thank you, Nicole. Good morning to everyone. I am Ashley Stichinski. I'm an infectious disease fellow. Before we jump into talking about N95s, I'm going to give a brief overview of the necessary PPE to protect against COVID-19 with a focus on low resource healthcare settings. Healthcare workers are especially vulnerable to becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2, as we've seen in Italy, Spain, Russia, and the US. However, with appropriate use of PPE, healthcare worker infections are largely preventable, even in settings with limited resources. Next slide. PPE is only one of many strategies to reduce risk to healthcare workers, and it is the least effective. PPE use should be coupled with strategies that minimize the amount of virus present in the healthcare facility. For example, Triage and cohorting can reduce healthcare workers from being exposed to potentially infected individuals. Similarly, improving ventilation and enhancing hand washing can lower the burden of infectious particles in the environment. Next slide. To understand what PPE is required, we must first understand how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted. Here we have an overview of the chain of infection. We start with an infectious agent, which in this case is SARS-CoV-2, and the virus that causes COVID-19. The reservoir of this virus can be either symptomatic 
or asymptomatic individuals. In fact, evidence suggests that SARS-CoV-2 infections among healthcare workers commonly occur in non-COVID wards, which goes along with the peak viral load occurring two days before until two days after symptoms manifest. Virus typically enters the environment in the context of respiratory secretions, which can be generated by coughing, sneezing, singing, or talking. Virus has also been detected in stool, though its role in transmission is unclear. We do know that people can become infected through droplet, contact, and aerosol routes. This is because there are receptors for the virus in the nasal epithelium and the lower respiratory tract. Of note, the virus does not pass through intact skin. The only way for contact transmission to occur is when the virus is passed from a surface to a susceptible portal of entry, namely mucous membranes. We don't know the relative impact of droplet versus aerosol transmission. The major difference is how close you have to be to the source, about one to two meters for droplet and more than two meters for aerosol, and the size of the particles. Aerosols are much smaller than droplets. Right now, we believe transmission is largely driven by droplets, with some exceptions in the healthcare setting when aerosol generating procedures are performed, such as intubation, CPR, or collection of nasal swabs. And we know that anyone can be a susceptible host. Next slide. The type of PPE required depends on the modes of transmission you may be exposed to. If you are entering a cohort area, for example, but have no patient contact, you only need a surgical mask as you are only at risk for droplet transmission. If you are providing direct patient care, you need protection against both droplet and contact transmission. So in addition to a surgical mask, you'll need gloves and a gown. Additionally, because of the risk for close range droplets directly onto mucous membranes, facial protection is also required. If you are at risk of exposures to aerosols, a surgical mask is not sufficient you will need additional respiratory protection, such as from an N95 or FFP2 to filter out smaller particles. Cleaners of COVID wards and laboratory technicians require similar protection to healthcare workers, as do visitors. This set of recommendations for use of PPE during COVID is supported by both the World Health Organization and CDC. Next slide. A systematic review of interventions to prevent spread of respiratory viruses supports the current recommendations for PPE use during COVID. The systematic review is largely based on studies conducted with respiratory syncytial virus and during the first SARS outbreak. Given the similarities in transmission routes, we anticipate these same strategies will be effective for COVID-19. Frequent hand washing and mask wearing were the most robust interventions maintaining significance across multivariable models. Notably, mask wearing included the use of either surgical or cloth masks. Given the overlapping confidence intervals, it is difficult to identify a single most important intervention, but each of these components demonstrated good efficacy, providing 50 to 90% protection. Next slide. And during the current SARS-CoV-2 outbreak, a cross-sectional study was conducted among healthcare workers in China. In this study, adequate PPE was provided along with training on infection control practices. Notably, none of the 420 healthcare workers became infected despite having high-risk contact with COVID-19 patients. This demonstrates that the current PPE guidelines offer sufficient protection against COVID-19 when used correctly and consistently. Next slide. I want to make a few points about masks based on updated guidance by the WHO published in early June. WHO recommends continuous wear of masks when providing care, even in non-COVID wards, when there is known or suspected community transmission of SARS-CoV-2. This means a healthcare worker can wear a mask for the entire duration of a shift. The times when a mask must be changed include if it becomes wet, soiled, or damaged, as this can impact the filtration efficiency, and when caring for patients on contact or droplet precautions for reasons other than COVID-19, and this is to avoid cross-contamination. The WHO acknowledges that a major risk associated with continuous use is the risk for self-contamination if touching the outside of the mask. Thus, it is important to perform hand hygiene immediately after contacting the outside of any PPE. 
After conducting an extensive review of the literature, WHO concluded that surgical masks are non inferior to N95, FFP2, and FFP3 masks when providing routine patient care. Thus, these type of masks should be reserved for aerosol generating procedures. Next slide. More PPE does not mean more protection. Two items that are not required to protect against COVID-19 are head coverings and shoe covers. This is because the virus is not transmitted in a way that makes either of these likely pathways for propagating disease spread. In fact, healthcare workers are at highest risk of becoming exposed to the virus during doffing of PPE. In particular, removal of shoe covers and head covers results in some of the highest rates of self-contamination. When considering these figures, it may actually be riskier to wear too much PPE. Next slide. To reduce the risk of self-contamination, it is important to follow safe doffing practices. The most important thing to remember is to avoid touching the outside of the PPE, which can be contaminated. Gloves should be removed first by pinching in the middle of the glove to peel off the first glove. Hold the removed glove in your gloved hand and slide fingers of the ungloved hand under the remaining glove at the wrist and peel off the second glove over the first glove. Step two is to pull the gown down and away from the neck and shoulders, only touching the inside of the gown. Fold or roll into a bundle and discard. If you're using a disposable gown, you can combine removal of gown and gloves in one step by peeling off gloves at the same time as removing the gown. Step three is to remove face protection by lifting the head strap or ear pieces from the back. Step four is to remove your mask. If wearing an N95 or FFP2, you will grasp the bottom strap first, which Nicole will demonstrate later. If you are wearing a surgical mask, you can grab the ear loops with your fingers and remove it that way. Step five is to perform hand hygiene. Always perform hand hygiene after removing PPE and at any point that hands touch the outside of the PPE. Next slide. What if my facility runs out of PPE? There are three ways you can continue to protect yourself even in the face of limited PPE. These strategies are inferior to using standard recommendations, but they are supported by WHO and CDC as mitigation strategies during times of limited resources. The first strategy is extended use. This refers to wearing PPE for longer than a single patient encounter. When you are caring for multiple patients with the same diagnosis, in this case, COVID-19, you can wear the same PPE for the duration of the shift, as long as it's not soiled or damaged. Decontamination and reuse is another way to extend the life of PPE. Decontamination reduces the risk for self-contamination, making reuse a safer possibility. However, it is important to use a decontamination method that is effective without compromising the quality of the PPE. Finally, substitution is a last resort when there is no PPE available. This refers to using non-standard materials to provide protection. Though PPE substitutes will offer less protection than standard PPE, they can be used when protection when nothing else is available. Next slide. Regardless of whether you have any PPE, hand hygiene remains one of the most important ways for healthcare workers to protect themselves. In the setting of COVID-19, washing with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub are considered equally effective methods for hand hygiene. In a recent study of risk factors for healthcare workers becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2, suboptimal hand washing was on par with improper PPE use. This is a reminder that the basics of infection prevention still hold true and remain of paramount importance for protecting healthcare workers. Next slide. One of the most critical components of PPE to protect healthcare workers during COVID is use of a face mask. This is because droplet and to some extent aerosol transmission are the main drivers for SARS-CoV-2 spread. N95, KN95, and FFP2 masks offer the greatest protection against both droplets and aerosols. As such, they should be prioritized for use during aerosol generating procedures. A surgical mask provides protection primarily against droplets. This is an appropriate level of protection for most activities in the healthcare setting. 
A cloth mask should only be considered if no surgical masks are available. Per WHO recommendations, N95, FFP2, and surgical masks can be worn up to six hours at a time. I won't discuss decontamination of N95 since we'll be going into that in more detail later in this webinar. For surgical masks, CDC allows for limited reuse. If you are to reuse the mask, you need to remain mindful that the outer surface could be contaminated. Therefore, to store the mask, you should fold it in half so the outer surface is touching itself to minimize the risk of coming into contact with the virus. And always wash your hands after removing a mask. If no N95 or FFP2 masks are available and you must perform an aerosol generating procedure, surgical masks offer the next best protection, particularly if combined with a face shield. Cloth masks should always remain a last resort. If you must use a cloth mask, you can hit next on the slide. WHO recommends at least three layers of tightly woven fabrics. However, effectiveness will depend not only on the type of cloth, but also on a secure fit around the mouth and nose. Notice in this graph that even with an N95 mask, gaps substantially decrease the effectiveness. Next slide. The main purpose of gloves is to reduce the amount of virus that ends up on your hands. However, remember that virus on your hands does not in itself lead to infection unless your hands contact a viable source, namely mucous membranes. The same reduction in virus can also be achieved with an extended duration of hand washing, for example, one to two minutes. Therefore, gloves are primarily a way to enhance your hand hygiene. The ideal practice is to change your gloves between every patient to ensure you're not spreading infections. However, if you have a limited supply of gloves, CDC advises that alcohol-based hand rub can be applied to latex or nitro gloves up to six times without compromising the protection of the gloves. If you have absolutely no gloves available, extended hand washing can provide equivalent protection. Next slide. A face shield or goggles is recommended to reduce the risk of droplets directly contacting the mucous membrane of the eyes, such as if someone sneezes or coughs nearby. Is there a difference between goggles and face shields? Yes and no. Both WHO and CDC recognize goggles and face shields as sufficient eye protection. However, we know from other studies that face shields can reduce the risk of contaminating the outer portion of masks. Since doffing is a high-risk procedure for virus transmission, reducing external contamination can minimize risk to health workers. Additionally, Face shields offer a 68 to 96% reduction in aerosol exposure, so they can enhance the efficacy of face masks. During the first SARS outbreak, researchers found a threefold reduction in SARS infections among nurses who wore face shields compared with those who did not. Face shields also prevent people from touching their faces, which can minimize self-contamination. Furthermore, face shields can be locally produced with inexpensive materials. Either a face shield or goggles can be reused indefinitely as long as the visibility is not compromised. Decontamination can be performed using 70% alcohol solution, 0.5% chlorine solution, or just about any detergent or disinfectant. This should be performed at least daily. Your choice of cleaning agent will depend on what's available to you and whether it compromises the visibility or quality of the eye protection. If you find yourself without either a face shield or goggles, there are many options for making your own face shield, such as with a two liter soda bottle. As long as it covers the forehead to chin and ear to ear, it meets FDA requirements for protection. Next slide. A gown is intended to reduce contamination of clothing and subsequent contact transmission. There are no specific requirements by CDC or WHO on acceptable gown material. The only requirement is having waterproof protection if splashes or sprays are anticipated and during aerosol generating procedures. A gown can be worn for the duration of a shift unless soiled. If it is a reusable gown, it should be laundered at least daily. If no gowns are available, lab coats, aprons, and layered clothing can be used. Next slide. We've summarized these recommendations into an infographic that has been translated into Spanish, French, and Portuguese that we are happy to share. And this can be used as a tool to hang in a healthcare facility to remind healthcare workers how to protect themselves. Next slide.
Thank you, Ashley. Now we're going to pause for a quick uh, question and answer session that will be led by our co-panelists, Lynn and Marianne. Hi, thank you uh, all so much for joining and thank you, Ashley, for your wonderful talk. Um, my name is Marianne. I'm a PhD student at Stanford uh, in electrical engineering. Um, and Lynn, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Lynn Stoller and I work in public health at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, all right, we have a couple questions um, for Ashley at this time. Um, for people who have questions, please type them into the chat um, and uh, we, we will not be um, calling on people who are raising their hands. Um, so Ashley, the first question, um, could you please give examples of aerosol generating procedures? Sure, so aerosol generating procedures are anything that can cause small particles to be released into the environment. So things that we know commonly can cause this include endotracheal intubation, uh, bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, even administering nebulized medications. And then something that people have been especially concerned about during this outbreak is positive pressure ventilation. So the use of a CPAP or a BiPAP device. These have all been shown to be uh, risk factors for producing more aerosols. And then for people who are involved in specimen collection, it's important to remember that collecting a nasal swab from a patient for a COVID test is also considered an aerosol generating procedure. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Lynn, do you have the next question? Yes, so Ashley, the next question asks, in my facility, there's limited PPE, which has resulted in washing of disposable gowns. Is it safe to wash disposable gowns? So disposable gowns are not intended to be washed, hence why they are disposable. And often they are made with a material whose integrity does not stand up to washing. Uh, and so in general, the advice would be to not uh, wash a disposable gown, that those must be disposed of, that they are not approved for repeated use. If you're dealing with limited gowns, however, many materials can be used to make a reusable gown. Things like cottons and polyesters are perfectly fine and can undergo just routine laundering procedures um, for reuse. And so that would be a better solution than trying to wash a disposable gown. Wonderful. Thank you, Ashley. We really appreciate it. Next, we'll be moving on to our next speaker, uh, who is Kezi, I believe. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Kezi Chen. I uh, am a PhD student studying material science at Harvard University, and I will be discussing the background on N95 masks before we dive into the decontamination methods. So there are many types of masks, and the, these masks range in the protection it provides the users. On the left, we have the um, homemade masks, and on the right, we have powerful uh, air purifying respirators. In the middle, where most particles are removed and filtered out, are filtering face piece respirators, such as N95s and elastomeric respirators. Under typical situations, N95s are disposable, whereas elastomerics are reusable for non-biohazardous work. Here, we will focus on FFRs, particularly N95s, that could be reused through decontamination due to supply constraints of N95s around the world. Next slide. As you saw on the previous slide, there are many models of N95s. In addition, there are also many international equivalents of NIOSH-approved N95s, such as the European FFP2 respirators, as well as the Chinese KN95s. However, these FFRs are designed for a range of purposes, for filtering out non-oil-based particles, such as those resulting from wildfires, PM2.5 air pollutions, or bioaerosols. And they're tested under different requirements, such as flow rate for filtration efficiency and pressure drop. So before selecting a respirator, that's equivalent to N95, users should consult with their local public health authorities for selection guidance. Next. There are a number of documents updated by the FDA and CDC regarding N95 equivalents, such as 
uh, counterfeits of NIOSH approved masks, uh, EUA for authorized import, non-NIOSH approved FFRs from other countries and from China. Um, please take a look at these documents before selecting or purchasing equivalent N95s. Next. The name N95 respirator is descriptive in its functionality. N is for non-oil resistant, whereas R and P stands for oil resistant and oil proof. The number 95 stands for 95% of particles of a medium diameter is filtered out. And 100 means greater than 99.7% filtration. Respirator implies that all inhaled air is filtered if worn properly, whereas masks imply a barrier and surgical implies a hydrophobic splash barrier. Next. So the N95 respirator is worn to protect people from hazardous substances while allowing airflow. It does not protect users from vapors or gas. Particles in the air that contain the virus could come in many droplet form, droplet sizes, and they're not all necessarily as small as the virus. These are produced by breathing, coughing, and speaking, speaking by an infected person. Breathing in these particles through the nose or mouth or transporting particles by touching your face is a primary trans uh, transmission pathway for COVID-19. Next. The two important functionalities of N95 is having a good seal around the face and a good filter such that the harmful particles do not go through the mask. The N95 consists of several layers of which the middle one acts as a filter layer and the outer and inner ones are for support and comfort. These layers are made of polymeric materials and there's typically a aluminum nose clip that molds to a nose for a better seal. Um, this is one potential barrier to the microwave method for decontamination. The straps are either around the ears or behind the head to hold the mask in place. And in some N95s, there is cellulose material, which is incompatible with hydrogen peroxide vapor method. Next. In the filter layer, there is an electric filter media that's made of a melt-blown, non-woven polypropylene material. It's a material that traps respiratory droplets by electrostatic charge attraction, and therefore fibers can have relatively large pore size for good airflow and breathability while still having a high filtration efficiency. A tight seal is equally as important, and users must perform seal check qualitatively each time they don a mask and a fit test once a year. Filter efficiency can be greatly reduced through physical damage of the mask or loss in charge. And seal can be greatly reduced through improper donning as well as poor fit, facial hair, and structural degradation of the mask, strap, and the nose piece. So to summarize, when we think about decontaminating these masks, in addition to killing any virus that might be present, it's also essential to ensure that both fit and filtration standards are preserved after the process. Next, please. Respirators that protect you from inhaling particles have been designed for different types of settings. Here we're showing on the left a respirator intended for medical use, whereas the one on the right is intended for industrial use, like sanding. A key difference for valve versus noun valve N95 is the protection it has for the wearer versus the protection it has for the others. So the vent on the right allows unfiltered exhalation, which should not be used for healthcare settings. Next. Like I mentioned, there, there are many counterfeits of N95s, and therefore it's important to do mask validation through batch testing of the mask. These are some ways that manufacturers validate if masks meet the specifications and they can be performed in labs or through third-party vendors. You can find the specifications using the NIOSH standard TSI 8130. The filtration efficiency is the percentage of particles that are blocked by the filter. And to measure the filtration efficiency, N-series FFRs are tested at a flow rate of 85 liters per meter using charge-neutralized polydispersed sodium chloride aerosols. 
N95s achieve filtration efficiency of greater than 95% for particle size ranging from 0.02 to 0.3 microns. And masks are also tested for pressure drop, which is the resistance to airflow across the mask. Greater resistance means that it will be harder to breathe through the mask. I think with that, um, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Kezi. So uh, we have a question here. Do all masks similar to N95s have electrical charge? Is this a problem when performing decontamination? So uh, N95 equivalents sh should have electrostatic charge. And this is actually one of the, um, the key aspects to, um, I guess, when, when it comes to decontamination, there are a lot of methods that will um, take away the charge, the electrostatic charge on the mask. For example, washing it in soapy waters or um, in um, ethanol or uh, um, IPA. So we will be discussing that a little bit in detail later on in the decontamination methods, but if they are a N95 equivalent, they should have electrostatic charge, yeah. Uh, thank you, Kezi. Uh, we have one more question for you. Um, with the increased demand for N95s, how does one tell the difference between fraudulent masks and genuine ones? Um, so that's a very good question. Um, in the slides, uh, I posted a few links to FDA and CDC websites that go through some of the counterfeit examples of N95 equivalents. But the best way to test if an N95 meets spec is to do it through um, filtration efficiency test, pressure drop test, and fit tests. So that's the best way to figure out if, if what you have is uh, on par with the N95s. Thank you so much, Kezi. Um, I think we're ready now for Nicole's talk. Hi again. Uh, my name is Nicole Starr. Uh, for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, I'm a surgical resident at University of California, San Francisco, and the senior fellow at Lifebox Foundation. So now I'll be sharing some information about ensuring you have the right fit of your N95 mask, as well as proper donning and doffing technique. In the United States, fit testing for N95s is a required procedure, and this determines which model and size of N95 mask best fits your face to ensure a tight seal. This is usually required annually, but during the COVID-19 pandemic, our occupational health guidance has changed so that any previous fit testing result is accepted and the annual testing requirement was suspended. Fit testing is not often used in low resource settings, so I want to explain the process in detail. First, the user puts on a non-breathable hood, like pictured here, and the tester sprays either a or sweet tasting aerosol substance under the hood, so the user has a baseline of what taste to expect during the test. The user then puts on an N95 mask and the process is repeated. This time, when the substance is sprayed, the user should not taste the bitter or sweet taste from the aerosol if the mask fits properly. They also perform head turning and other maneuvers to make sure that moving the head does not allow any aerosols to enter. If the user does taste the substance, they should adjust the straps and mask position and nose piece or try a different size or model until the test is passed. Once the user has a passing test result, they should use that mask type and size going forward. The donning, seal check, and doffing process is critically important to protect healthcare workers from aerosol transmission of viral illnesses. The key concerns of this process should be to ensure proper fit of the mask and to prevent self-contamination. I'll demonstrate this process for you now. So to don the mask, use clean or gloved hands to cup the mask. Place it over your face and pull the upper strap over the crown of your head, followed by the lower strap down to your neck. Adjust the mask so it covers your nose and chin. Then press, don't pinch the nose piece, 
so it fits the bridge of your nose. Now you're ready to perform a seal check. The seal check is similar to the fit test in that it ensures you have a tight seal to the face and aerosols cannot enter around the edges of the mask. This should be done every time you don the mask. For a negative pressure seal check, place your hands around the edges of the mask and inhale. You should feel the mask seal to your face and bow slightly inwards, and you should not feel air escaping in around the edges. This is the best test if you have an N95 mask with an exhalation valve. For a positive pressure seal check, you want to exhale against the mask. You should not feel air escape around the edges of the mask, and you should feel a slight positive pressure inside the mask before the seal is broken. To doff or remove N95s, care should be taken not to contaminate yourself. Remove the mask after you exit any patient area where aerosols might be present and assume the front of the mask is contaminated. Perform hand hygiene, then remove the lower strap first up and over your head. You want to grab the strap towards the back of your neck, not close to the mask where it might be contaminated. Removing the lower strap first prevents the contaminated side of the mask from falling forward onto your chest. Next, remove the upper strap and lift the mask away from your face. Place it into a clean container for decontamination. Then perform hand hygiene before touching anything else. There are recommendations from the CDC on extended use or reuse of PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic and resulting shortages, as Ashley mentioned. Conservation strategies should also include limiting the personnel or clinical situations where N95s are used. Extended use is an option and has less risk of self-contamination than reuse, which involves multiple donning and doffing cycles. If you must reuse N95 masks, which means donning the N95 mask again without decontamination between patient encounters, make sure you have the proper storage containers and do not share masks between users. If masks will be stored and reused, there are some important considerations. First, the containers must be breathable. You can use a plastic container with holes punched in the top or a cardboard takeout container. You can also use a paper bag. This will prevent the growth of other mold or bacteria on the mask during storage. Placing the mask face down and securing straps over the side of your container also prevents the contaminated side of the mask from touching multiple sides of the storage container. Make sure you either dispose of or decontaminate storage containers after every use. Do not reuse heavily contaminated N95s, for example, those after aerosol generating procedures. These should be decontaminated right away. Don't share N95s between different users and don't let the straps touch the front of the mask as this will increase the chance for self-contamination. N95 masks can be set aside for decontamination after aerosol generating procedures or after a certain time period of wear as designated by your hospital. N95s that are obviously soiled on the outside with blood or body fluids or on the inside with makeup, oils like lotions or Vaseline, or are deformed or torn should not be decontaminated. These must be thrown away. Now we'll pause for another brief Q&A session before moving on to the decontamination method specifics. Wonderful, thank you so much, Nicole. So for our first question, uh, we, oh, apologies. So for our first question, um, we'd like to ask, is there a requirement for quantitative fit testing? Let's say the use of port account equipment. So this is typically not employed in the clinical setting, um, not even during usual uh, non-pandemic times in the United States. The qualitative fit test takes the place of that, um, the process I described to you with the hood and the aerosolized substance takes the place of that quantitative fit test for a clinical provider. Thank you, Nicole. And we just have one more question for you. Um, a lot of people um, are curious about the use of surgical masks and N95s together. Do you have any comment on that practice? 
Sure. So it's, it's been commonly employed during the pandemic, the practice to wear a surgical mask over the N95 mask in the thought that it would prevent uh, contamination of the external surface of the N95 mask. One concern about this is just that added layer decreasing the ability to breathe through both mask layers. And there are some small studies that have shown that in fact, that's not an issue of uh, inhibiting the respiration of the person wearing the mask and doesn't cause any additional feeling of uh, anxiety or discomfort while wearing the two masks together. This might be a good method just to prevent gross decontamination of your N95 if you're planning to decontaminate it. Um, but as always, you need to take very careful precautions not to contaminate yourself when removing both masks. And the N95 would still need to be decontaminated after use. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I think we're ready for our next talk by Tyler. Great, thank you, Marianne. Um, all right, yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Tyler Chen. I'm a PhD student at Stanford and a uh, Knight Hennessy Scholar in Bioengineering. Um, and today I'll be giving the session on, yeah, general decontamination principles and the specific methods of N95 decontamination that we've uh, looked at in our research. So in general, I'm going to be uh, saying this a lot. So this is, a, this is a, you know, you'll get this a lot of times. The most important things to think about when considering different decontamination methods are these things you see right here. So a decontamination method must not damage the N95's ability to filter particles, um, like Kezi talked about. Um, the method must not damage the N95's fit, that tight seal to the face that Nicole was demonstrating. And most importantly, of course, the method must reduce the bio burden on the N95. Um, decontamination certainly needs to kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, and if possible, decontamination should also shoot to kill other pathogens as well. So when decontaminating and reusing masks, it's very important to consider not only the risk of infection from SARS-CoV-2 uh, if the mask is not fully decontaminated, but also the risk of uh, contamination from other pathogens that might be on the mask. Um, and finally, the decontamination method should not leave hazardous residue that might pose a threat to the healthcare worker. So, in the uh, evidence sections of this presentation, we'll be presenting some evidence supporting three decontamination approaches, as well as some of their risks and limitations. Um, and I do want to highlight that while the majority of the sources we cite in this presentation have either gone through peer review or are being implemented by hospitals, um, I want to communicate a word of caution concerning preprint studies uh, that have not yet gone peer review because they're uh, widely ranging in quality and may have some inaccuracies in their approach. So in this presentation, we've highlighted any non-peer reviewed studies uh, with an asterisk to make sure that it's clear uh, that that study has not yet gone through that peer review process. All right, next slide. Awesome, so we'll start now with N95 performance, talking about the filtration and fit. Um, it's important to note that when we're considering how the decontamination will affect the N95 mask, it's important that it's very highly dependent on the decontamination method and on the N95 model that's used. So we wish we could say there's a one size fits all method that will not damage any type of mask no matter how many times you use it. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So certain methods may damage fit or filtration after just a few cycles, uh, whereas others may allow more cycles before the mask performance becomes unacceptable. Um, so you can see our, our website, n95decon.org slash publications uh, for more specific information on how many cycles each mask type can withstand for each of these decontamination methods. And we'll go into detail on this in each of the following sections. Uh, and another very important point is that even without decontamination, some N95 models lose their proper fit to the face after putting them on just five times. Um, so it's crucial to do a user seal check to make sure the N95 fits before each use. Um, this is without any decontamination at all. So just the elastic on the straps may get degraded just over a long period of use. Next slide, please. All right, so when evaluating how effective a method is for decontamination, we will consider the hierarchy of resistance of pathogens to decontamination. So if we look at this scale from resistant to susceptible, some of the hardest organisms to kill are bacterial spores. So higher level disinfection methods 
are able to achieve a six log reduction in the viable bacterial spores. Uh, log reduction is defined as a tenfold decrease in the, num in the concentration of the pathogen. So a six log reduction effectively should reduce about 1 million active pathogens to one or less. Now, we know our primary goal in the decontam is the, the decontamination of N95 respirators for reuse in the emergency case of COVID-19 uh, is inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, the virus is an enveloped RNA virus and is at the bottom of this resistance scale you see here. So the FDA has recommended at least a three log reduction against the virus for uh, emergency use authorization of any decontamination procedure. So this is defined as being able to reduce 1,000 active viruses to one or less. Now, some methods we will discuss, such as humid heat, may, ach may achieve that three log reduction of the virus, but may not achieve that same reduction of other bacteria and more resistant pathogens. So these will still remain a concern if some of these methods are used. Next slide, please. Uh, now, before we get into the specifics of the decontamination methods that are shown to be effective in the literature, uh, it's important to, to know that some methods are not likely to be effective for decontamination, um, and this has been shown in various peer-reviewed literature. Um, these methods include soap, alcohol, bleach immersion, and gamut irradiation, which have been shown to damage the N95 filtration and should not be used for decontamination. Now, there are some other methods, such as storing a mask overnight, using home UV sources like a nail salon and sunlight. Um, these methods are unlikely to kill the virus on an N95 mask. Um, they either have insufficient time or insufficient dose of the UVC radiation that has been shown to inactivate the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and should not be used for decontamination. Finally, there's an important note that contaminated masks should not be brought home. Um, since this is a significant contamination risk, and decontamination should occur only at a secure site, such as at a hospital or at a third-party decontamination provider. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of our N95 decontamination principles. Uh, remember, any method that you're evaluating for N95 decontamination needs to preserve the N95 filtration efficiency, preserve the N95 fit, which may be highly method-dependent, um, it needs to achieve at least a three log reduction of SARS-CoV-2 and preferably a higher level decontamination method should be used that can achieve a six log reduction of bacterial spores. Um, and finally, hazardous residues should be minimized. So now I'm going to go into the, a few of the decontamination methods that we've evaluated uh, and seem to be likely candidates to be effective against SARS-CoV-2 and decontamination of N95 respirators. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with our first decontamination method, which is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. Now, this method uses specific instruments from companies including BioQuell and Steris that generate hydrogen peroxide vapor. So hydrogen peroxide is a strong sterilant and reacts with many biological substances to produce reactive oxygen species that can destroy membrane lipids, proteins, and DNA and RNA. Now, one benefit of hydrogen peroxide is that it can penetrate dark spaces, unlike light. And the final breakdown products are non-harmful, um, although the residue can be harmful if it is not allowed to outgas for long enough. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide vapor method has been shown to inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as more resistant organisms, such as bacterial spores, on an N95 after a manufacturer-approved cycle. And it's been shown that these methods do not damage the N95 filter or straps after 20 cycles. Um, hydrogen peroxide is a respiratory hazard. So when implementing any of these hydrogen peroxide vapor methods, it's very important to have controlled airflow and sufficient aeration of the mask to make sure that these vapors are not vented to an unsafe part of the facility. Um, hydrogen peroxide vapor, unfortunately, does require equipment that is usually expensive and trained personnel to operate it. Um, and ex equipment specific protocols must be applied for this method to be effective. Um, one other important point is that hydrogen peroxide, while it does not damage the uh, straps or filter of the N95 after 20 cycles, um, it does, it is not compatible with cellulose and uh, N95 material, uh, models containing cellulose 
uh, should not be used with this method. Um, and you can find on our website at n95decon.org slash hydrogen peroxide, you can find a full listing in the end of our technical report that has a list of all the N95 models which do not contain cellulose and therefore can be used with this vaporized hydrogen peroxide method. Next slide, please. So as a, as a summary of this method, if properly executed, this vaporized hydrogen peroxide may inactivate viruses and bacterial spores by greater than six log, making it an effective high level disinfection method. Um, however, a biological or chemical indicator should be included for each, uh, each cycle so that it's, uh, you can verify the effectiveness of this method. Um, with regards to the N95 performance, the fit and filtration have been shown to be preserved after up to 20 cycles, um, although it is not compatible with N95s containing cellulose. And you should check the cycle number allowed for each specific hydrogen peroxide method, because each manufacturer may have different guidelines based on their own hydrogen peroxide machine. Now, a uh, couple other concerns. Uh, the machine specific methods should be used and proper aeration time of the N95 is important before reuse. Um, another method that has been suggested uh, for lower resource settings has been the use of 6% liquid hydrogen peroxide, um, which is highly accessible but has not yet been validated for the required uh, aeration time or for viral inactivation on the surface. Um, so this is a method that is not yet validated. Um, so that's it for the hydrogen peroxide method. There's a lot more information on our website at n95decon.org slash hydrogen peroxide. Um, but for now, we'll move on to the second method, which is UVC, ultraviolet C radiation. So when we speak of UV decontamination, we're referring specifically to the germicidal UVC region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you see the purple region there, that is the germicidal UVC region. Now, uh, if you look at this full spectrum, you see there's different colors or wavelengths of visible light on the right. And as we move down to lower wavelengths, which have higher energy, we pass through the non-germicidal UVA region, the minimally germicidal UVB region, and finally the germicidal UVC wavelength range. And, and when you move past that look, uh, UVC wavelength, um, the light can generate ozone from the air, which is a health hazard. So a lot of people ask why that UVC region is germicidal. And this is shown in the germicidal action spectrum, which is below the electromagnetic spectrum you see there. So if you see the place where it says wavelength, that purple line um, is, uh, shows where the germicidal action is near its peak. Um, so this plot here with germicidal action shows how effective light is at inactivating pathogens as a function of wavelength. Now there's a peak in the action spectrum around 260 nanometers, if you see just to the right of that purple line. And this is because UVC irradiation inactivates pathogens by damaging their genomic material. And DNA and RNA have their maximum UV absorption around 260 nanometers. So this increased efficacy in this range is why the wavelength range surrounding 260 nanometers is typically used for UV decontamination. Next slide, please. So within the germicidal UVC range, the evidence from the peer-reviewed literature indicates that an irradiation dose, which is the total intensity, the integrated intensity of light that is delivered to the N95, uh, the irradiation dose of at least one joule per centimeter squared inactivates viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 on an N95 material. Now, it's important to note that the N95 straps are not as effectively decontaminated with UVC as the face pieces. So the straps may require a secondary decontamination, such as wiping with a compatible disinfectant. Another important point, this dose that I've suggested of one joule per centimeter squared uh, is the minimum required dose for an N95, uh, but it is one to two orders of magnitude higher than the doses that have been reported to be needed for surface decontamination. And this difference is very important um, because surface protocols are not sufficient for de decontamination of N95s. 
Um, this is likely due to the attenuation of UVC light as it passes through the layers of the N95. So higher doses are required to decontaminate that inner layer of the respirator, which will see a lower dose than the surface. Now at these high UVC doses, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's valid to wonder whether we're going to damage the N95 materials. Um, there's evidence from the literature that suggests that 15 models of N95 kept their fit and filter performance after 10 to 20 cycles of UVC decontamination. With all that in mind, we believe that the limiting factor for reuse for UVC decontaminated masks will be fit loss from putting the mask on and, putting, and taking the mask off alone. So the user seal check is very important. Now, uh, with all this evidence that's been summarized here and more sources are available on our N95 decon technical report on UVC um, at, at our website, n95decon.org slash UVC. Next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, the evidence suggests that a germicidal UVC dose of at least one joule per centimeter squared delivered to all surfaces of the N95 is likely to inactivate the virus uh, or viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 on N95s. Um, although the amount of bioburden reduction you get will depend on the N95 model and the dose of UVC delivered. So this dose is absolutely crucial to decontamination. So it needs to be validated with a calibrated UVC specific sensor. Um, just relying on uh, a, a bulb alone without measuring that UVC dose uh, may not give you the value that is uh, listed on the, the specs for that bulb. So it's important to validate that dose by measuring it with a sensor. Um, also, the, again, the straps may require secondary decontamination. Um, and the dose is not likely to inactivate all other pathogens other than SARS-CoV-2 throughout the layers of the N95. So each N95, if decontaminated, should be returned to its original user only and not cross-contaminated with other N95s during the process. Um, again, at these doses from the evidence, we suggest that the limiting factor for N95 longevity will be fit loss from donning and doffing the mask alone rather than any damage from the decontamination protocol itself. Um, also, it's important to note that UVC is hazardous to uh, human cells and appropriate engineering controls and PPE are crucial to not expose humans to UVC. Uh, additionally, several UV sources, including home UV, sunlight, and sources outputting low wavelength UVC are not appropriate for UVC decontamination. All right, so that's it for UVC, and we're going to move on to heat inactivation. So when people talk about heat inactivation, uh, it's really what is required is a combination of heat and time, um, and potentially also humidity, which has been shown to increase inactivation by heat-based methods. Um, so ideally, again, we, wanted, we, would, we would want to be able to say any, you know, any mask can be put at this temperature, and it will be you know, fine and decontaminated. But again, that is not the case. This method, while it seems very easy, actually is a very complex parameter space and is much harder to uh, achieve than one might believe. So at lower temperatures, there's a risk of reduced viral inactivation. So if you have a mask at a lower temperature, the virus may not be killed. Uh, at a higher temperature, there's a risk of damage to the N95. So Therefore, there's a sweet spot target range in the range of 70 to 85 degrees Celsius and a humidity range of 50 to 85 percent humidity um, and a time duration of greater than one hour, which seems likely to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 to the three log level or greater. Uh, given the uh, on, on the majority of N95 masks without damaging the filtration or the fit. Next slide, please. So looking at the studies, uh, 70C dry heat for 60 minutes has been shown to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 on an N95 under lab conditions. Um, so what this means is that in a very controlled setting, in a specific uh, experimental setup, that 70C dry heat achieved a three log reduction in SARS-CoV-2 after 60 minutes. 
Um, however, this may not extend to uh, a typical hospital setting when the virus could be contained in mucus droplets or something else that might stabilize the virus. Um, so given this, it's important to add on uh, other uh, things such as humidity, which can increase inactivation of viruses uh, and therefore give you a higher margin of safety uh, in a decontamination method such as this. Um, SARS-CoV-2 was not sufficiently inactivated by 70 C dry heat for 30 minutes on an N95 and was also not sufficiently inactivated by 70 C dry heat uh, for 60 minutes on metal. So I know there's a lot of misconceptions out there uh, that SARS-CoV-2 will be inactivated by 3-log after 70 C for 30 minutes. Um, we have not seen that in the peer-reviewed or non-peer-reviewed literature. Um, so therefore, we would recommend, again, as we suggested earlier, the 70 C to 85 C temperatures with 50 to 85 percent humidity, which has been shown to increase in activation for at least 60 minutes. Um, finally, this method will not necessarily inactivate all bacterial or mold spores on the N95. So it's important to only return masks to the original user. Um, also, for the mask integrity, uh, many N95 models have been shown to survive these 30-minute or 60-minute cycles at 70 to 85 C and 50% humidity. Um, however, repeated cycles may damage N95 fit and filtration. So it's important to validate with your specific N95 model and the specific temperature range that you're using. Um, you can see more uh, information on this at our website, n95decon.org slash heat where we have a technical report that summarizes this in more detail. Um, one more question that's been asked is the use of autoclaves. Uh, autoclaves, traditional autoclave cycles of 121C or greater have been shown to damage the fit of many N95 masks. Um, and there has not yet been studies validating autoclaves for filtration. So autoclaves are currently not recommended for the use uh, in N95 decontamination. Um, in their traditional cycle. Next slide, please. So as uh, in summary, uh, promising conditions for inactivation of SARS-CoV-2 uh, on, uh, sorry, SARS-CoV-2 uh, inactivation on an N95 respirator are likely to be that 70 to 85 C temperature range, um, humidity greater than 50% for greater than 60 minutes. Uh, but data is still limited on these methods. Um, it's important to note that this method may not inactivate all other pathogens. Um, for the N95 performance, many common N95 models can retain fit and filtration after five cycles of 85C, 80% humidity and 30 minutes. So that indicates that this is uh, at least going to allow the mask to survive around three cycles of the 60 minute uh, cycle time. Um, some more implementation guidance. Uh, there are there's a possibility to put an N95 inside a container, um, take that container with some water added for moisture into an oven, a uh, convection oven. You can see more details on protocols that are listed on our website. Um, and target five, three to five cycles as a maximum. Um, one important point is that monitor the uh, temperature and humidity should be monitored um, because again, a lot of the uh, even though these methods for heat-based inactivation are very accessible, uh, the ovens and materials used to generate heat may not be well calibrated. So it's very important to have calibrated heat and humidity and no direct exposure of N95 masks to any heating element because that may damage the, uh, the N95 material. Um, this, these heat and humidity methods actually as of recently have been approved, uh, not approved, but they have been given an emergency use authorization in an FDA uh, process um, with a specific uh, method of steam sterilizer and a modified cycle that achieves these parameters that we've listed here. Um, so you can see more on that uh, on our website and on the FDA's website. Um, I, I see that there's a question of doing the hu humid heat method at home. Um, Again, we would caution against that because uh, the biggest risk of contamination in this case is going to be the self-contamination or cross-contamination from bringing these contaminated masks home. Um, so again, if possible, decontamination should always be carried out in a secure and safe location, such as at a hospital or at a third-party provider.
All right, so we'll go on to the final method here, which is just a very simple one that we call wait and reuse. Um, if there is no other choice, the CDC has listed storing an N95 at room temperature for multiple days as a method for possible decontamination. So unfortunately, there is very little data on how long an N95 needs to be left at room temperature to kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But from the few data points we do have, it seems that storing an N95 in a clean, breathable container at room temperature for seven days may inactivate the virus, whereas storing just overnight is certainly not sufficient to inactivate. So again, this method should only be used if there is no other choice for decontamination, since it does not protect the wearer against bacteria or mold that may be on the N95. And finally, of course, this N95 should only be reused by the original owner to maintain fit and prevent cross-contamination. All right, with that, I think we're on to a quick question and answer. All right, thank you so much, Tyler, for your talk. Um, I first have a question um, for you. Uh, does increasing the humidity beyond 85% reduce the effectiveness or does it change it at all? That's a great question, actually. Um, unfortunately, the science is not fully understood in that area. Um, generally, uh, we've seen mixed results. The, the general trend that we have seen, uh, which might not necessarily be you know, completely vetted, uh, there's very few data points, but the general trend we've seen is that there tends to be a peak in the inactivation rate between 50 and 85% humidity. Um, whereas temperature, or whereas humidity is above that uh, may reduce the inactivation rate um, and humidity is below that certainly will reduce the inactivation rate. So 0% uh, humidity is the least effective. We believe uh, 50 to 85 will likely have a, a peak in inactivation and humidity above uh, 85 may have reduced inactivation compared to that peak. Um, that said, I think there's no evidence suggesting that higher than 85% humidity uh, will have increased damage to the mask, assuming that the temperature parameters are still that 70 to 85C. Um, so there's some variability there, and I think the science is not completely understood as to what the exact humidity range should be. Thank you, Tyler. Lynn, uh, you have the next question? Yes, so our next question is for David Rempel. David, are there any studies on effectiveness of using ozone to decontaminate FFPs? Yeah, I think that might be a better um, question for Mike. Um, as far as I know, the ozone studies are still in their early stages and, um, and have not shown a consistent effectiveness in decontamination and preservation of the mask filtration. So that Mike may have another idea. Wonderful, thank you. Marianne? Uh, hi, um, do we have uh, Tom on the line for a question about UVC? Um, Tyler, maybe then I can ask you. Uh, sure. So if you just increase the uh, dose of UVC, does that improve the effectiveness of the decontamination? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, in general, the dose is definitely the right thing to think about. Um, higher dose of UVC specifically delivered to the surface of the mask or to the, the mask in general should achieve a higher level of decontamination. Um, but it's important to note that that dose must be in that germicidal UVC region. Um, there are a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of studies uh, using inaccurate sensors that may measure UVA or UVB uh, and inaccurately report that as a UVC dose. But it's important to note that that germicidal wavelength is what should be measured and used. And if you're in that region, increasing the, the dose that is delivered to the N95 should increase the total inactivation of SARS-CoV-2. 
Thank you. Um, however, actually, sorry, there's one quick point that, uh, thank you, Kezi. Um, however, to a certain point, uh, higher doses may uh, cause damage to the straps and the fit. So uh, again, the one joule per centimeter squared has been validated for 10 to 15 cycles on an N95. Um, whereas it's, if you're increasing the dose beyond that, it would be important to note uh, that difference in the total dose that is delivered to the N95 to ensure it's not being damaged. Awesome. So Tyler, we have one more question for you. Um, you know, we went over all of these different decontamination methods and one of the concerns is resource strapped settings. So we have some feedback from some of the audience members saying that most of these um, don't seem feasible in developing countries. What decontamination processes would be appropriate in these contexts or, um, you know, in their homes? Absolutely. Yeah, so in lower resource settings, um, there are a couple options. Um, so far, the heat and humidity method seems to be one that is relatively accessible. Um, and there have also been uh, non-peer reviewed studies demonstrating these heat methods in various uh, other contexts, so such as uh, using um, stovetop boiled water, uh, not boiling the mask directly, but using boiled water on a stove as a source of heat, taking that source of heat off the stove and then finding a way to keep the mask sealed and airtight, um, but immersing it in that liquid to increase the temperature. Um, so those, there, are, there are various methods of achieving these 70 to 85C, uh, 50 to 85% humidity uh, temperatures and, and treatment durations. Um, another possible method is the hydrogen peroxide immersion in 6% liquid hydrogen peroxide. Um, although, again, this one has not yet been validated in any uh, scientific studies so far as we know. So this is one that some caution should definitely be used uh, if trying to use this method. Um, and finally, of course, the wait and reuse method. Again, if possible, ideally one would wait up to seven days to before reusing an N95 to f sufficiently inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and that's one that could potentially be used, although I understand also there's a risk uh, that you know, hospitals don't have you know, sufficient supply to implement that method. Um, but we're uh, continually reviewing methods that are coming up for, that are available for lower resource settings. Um, and please feel free to contact us via our website um, if you have specific questions that we can help answer. Wonderful, thank you, Tyler. And thank you to all of our panelists that have answered our questions throughout this webinar. Um, that wraps it up for our Q&A, so I will handle it, hand it back to the Lightbox team. Great. Thank you, everyone, so much for wonderful attendance. Thank you to our panelists for your time and sharing your expertise, as well as to Lynn and Marianne for coordinating all the question and answers. Um, I did want to mention uh, one additional point on how can uh, providers or hospital teams in low resource settings access some of these materials. Uh, we are collaborating with the UVC team in about 15 different countries globally to try and deliver um, a cabinet uh, that has UVC bulbs uh, and, and a rack to decontaminate N95 masks. Uh, we're collaborating with engineers and hospital teams in multiple countries throughout the globe to try and implement this device. So it's in the early stages, um, but if this is something that you want to be involved with or learn more about, um, you can feel free to reach out to our team and we're happy to have others join on. Um, with that being said, we do have a WhatsApp group set up. If you'd like to um, join us and continue the conversation, you can use this QR code here. Um, please feel free to reach out with questions, with resources that you are finding, um, or to follow up on more information that's needed. Uh, the Lifebox team will also be uh, reaching out to all participants after this, just to learn from you about your impressions of this session. Uh, we will be posting the slides and the recording of this webinar on our website. And I've highlighted um, here a couple different resources you can access. So our N95 Decon, website uh, has a global resources tab. Apologies, it should be n95decon.org backslash global, um, but that's where you can find all our materials that have been translated 
into French, Spanish, uh, other languages always forthcoming, as well as our Lifebox website has